My name is uh, Dick Miller. I'm a uh, volunteer docent at the Marchfield Air Museum. And what you'll see today is uh, one of our exhibit aircraft, a B-29A Super Fortress, uh, circa 1940. I was privileged to fly the uh, B-24, B-17, and the B-29. And the Cadillac of bombers in that era was the B-29A, the Super Fortress. Great aircraft. Uh, this uh, aircraft uh, has the turrets removed. Uh, normally there were uh, four turrets, uh, gun turrets, remotely controlled by the scanners and the bombardier. Uh, there are uh, two on top, the upper forward, upper aft, and down underneath the uh, lower aft and lower forward. Uh, they were, uh, had two 50 caliber machine guns in all but the uh, top uh, upper forward turret, which had four machine guns in it. Uh, the tail gunner uh, had two 50 calibers back there. Initially, they put a 20 millimeter cannon back there, but they removed that uh, after a while. Uh, one thing uh, about uh, this aircraft, it was a, a fire bomber in World War II, uh, dropping uh, fire bombs on Japan. And uh, I don't uh, recall whether the turrets were removed after it came back or whether it was removed over there, but uh, General LeMay, who was the 21st, uh, uh, commander uh, decided that he wanted to run low altitude firebombing missions and to lighten the aircraft and to leave only the tail guns in to protect uh, the, the crew, uh, removed all the turrets. They could carry a bigger bomb load and that's why possibly the turrets are missing uh, on this particular aircraft because this was a firebomber. We had a crew of 11 on this aircraft, sometimes 12 if we had an electronic uh, countermeasure operator on it. And sometimes, of course, we carry the mission commander, which was another body, and sometimes as many as uh, 12 or 13 people on it. The bombardier uh, sat in the front in the nose with his bomb sight up there. Uh, pilot uh, on the right side, the aircraft commander on the left. Navigator sat in back of the pilot, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, or rather the uh, pilot right. And then the uh, flight engineer sat in back of him, uh, actually in front of the navigator. And on the other side was the uh, radar, a radio operator. Uh, in the rear of the aircraft, you had a uh, central fire control gunner. He was the one that uh, uh, had control, actually, of all the turrets. He was in that little blister up on top, and he had a little chair that swung around 360 degrees. He was called a ring gunner, too, as well as a central fire control gunner. We, had, uh, we didn't have gunners in the aircraft. We had scanners. Uh, they did, couldn't uh, touch the guns while in flight. Uh, they had uh, sighting stations at the blisters, and they used those sighting stations to control the turrets. And the turrets could be switched from gunner to gunner depending on where the attacks were coming from. The, uh, all of the turrets the, uh, would rotate 360 degrees, and they could point the guns as much as 90 degrees, so it's complete control of the turrets uh, by the scanners. Uh, in the rear of the aircraft, uh, also, uh, uh, back in the tail was a tail gunner. He was in his own pressurized compartment back there. Uh, in the uh, aircraft I was flying in uh, uh, Korea, the uh, radar bombardier navigator was in the rear also. And if there's an electronic countermeasure uh, person there, he was back in the, in the waist too. The uh, engines, uh, of course, four engines on the uh, B-29, uh, they're uh, right engines, uh, right aircraft, corporation engines. Uh, there uh, are 3350s. They're, of course, a reciprocating engine, not a jet. They had uh, four bladed Hamilton standard props on. Uh, with turbocharging and so forth, the uh, engines put out approximately 2200 horsepower each, so it was a very uh, well powered aircraft. And you note that the landing gear, double gear on this side, double tires doubled on the nose, doubled on the other side, of course. And that was on you know, heavyweight uh, takeoffs and landings. Uh, they needed just a little extra support. Okay. You note also that the, that the aircraft had two bomb bays, a forward and rear bomb bay. And uh, I might mention here as we go by that this is the, uh, where the exhaust comes out of the engines. During flight, uh, they would glow cherry red because of the heat. So you can see around this, they had areas where they put Zeus fasteners in. They had, had shrouds that covered the engines, or covered the uh, 
the exhaust area. And that was because of the fact that uh, in Korea, when we were flying at night, these things would glow cherry red, and the MiGs, who did not have radar, could still pick up these glowing stacks, and uh, that's why we needed the shrouds to cover the exhaust ports. Mm. You see a pretty hefty gear here. Had double bomb bays. Uh, you could carry uh, uh, 40 uh, 500 pound bombs, which was our normal load in, uh, in Korea. And uh, they had uh, 20 bomb stations in each bomb bay. Our uh, uh, armorers in uh, Korea also found a way to load 190 uh, 100 pound bombs in the bomb bay. Uh, in, uh, at night in uh, Korea, we also we carried 39 500 pounders. And we also carried three photo flash bombs. There were 100 uh, pounders filled with photo flash powder. And they were timed to explode uh, five minutes before bomb, bomb impact, at impact, and five seconds after. And by all of that light would trip our uh, camera, and they would take pictures automatically of the bomb drop. So it's quite an interesting uh, a series of events. This is one of the scanner stations. This is the right scanner. You see up on top the central fire control, a ring gunner station. Uh, in that uh, area there, they have a, a sighting station and a uh, flight or a gunnery control system. And uh, they never touched the guns. They uh, were all remotely controlled and remotely operated. Uh, very accurate turrets. Uh, they shot down as many as, uh, I know uh, for a fact, uh, five MiGs in a tour of duty over there. Uh, Major Don Kovic, who flew a command decision, which you might have seen pictures of, uh, that was a B-29 Ace, and they shot down uh, five MiGs with a gunnery system in the uh, B-29. There's a skid in the back, as you see, in the tail, and uh, in case uh, there was a little overzealous uh, movement of controls. And uh, very high fin, uh, very distinctive. And as we wrote, approach to the rear, you can see the uh, tail gunner station. Uh, he had 250 caliber machine guns. Uh, his area, approximately the front of the wing back, was pressurized. So he was in his own little pressurized compartment over there. The scanners, the radar people, so forth, in the center. Uh, had their own pressurized compartment, and then we'll go inside afterwards and see it, but then there was a tunnel connecting to the forward pressurized compartment where the rest of the crew were. Pretty much the same on this side, hopefully. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, when the B-29 came out in 1942 and they were designed uh, and came out and uh, it it, it was just an unbelievable situation where the, the B-29 was, in my opinion, at that time was a Cadillac of bombers. It was uh, pressurized, just, just a great airplane to fly in, very, very uh, uh, well set up defensively and uh, could take a lot of punishment and still, and still bring you back. Uh, not much else here. You saw the de-icer boots. In fact, if we had uh, ice on the, on the uh, control surfaces. They were pneumatic boots, and uh, you waited until the ice built up, and then you put some uh, air in, and uh, alternating uh, uh, segments in the boots would crack the ice off, and you'd go through the procedure again if you picked up more. But that was a typical uh, uh, ice uh, removal system in an older uh, aircraft like this one here. Is. From here you can see the two bomb bays, and uh, the bombardier who controlled the, uh, uh, the dropping of the bomb, not always the aiming of the uh, bombs, but the dropping, uh, he had an intervalometer up there, intervalometer, and what that would do is, because of the, the distance between the bomb bays, he would drop one in the front bomb bay, one in the rear, one in the front, one in the rear to keep the aircraft balanced make the center of gravity uh, maintain. And other than that, uh, that's pretty much the outside. And uh, uh, but as I mentioned, just a, just a great aircraft. Any aircraft that brings you back from a combat tour, you love. It's a great aircraft, and, and the B-29 certainly was, was one of those. Okay.
Okay, uh, this is the uh, cockpit in the B-29A, and uh, the uh, starting from front to rear here, uh, the bombardier, of course, was in the nose, and uh, uh, that is a Norden bomb site. Uh, when I went through bombardier school, uh, that was the uh, site that we used, obviously. A very accurate uh, bomb site. Uh, you had to see the target, of course. It wasn't directed by radar or so, it was just visual. As you look over, window, usually open uh, in on ground operation. Uh, and then the, the uh, instrument panel itself. Uh, fairly basic instruments. Uh, we didn't have glass panels back then, so we uh, only had instruments called, they're called round dials. And uh, uh, I, as an old timer, prefer these to the glass cockpits that they have nowadays, but uh, that's uh, personal preference. Anyway, as far as the, uh, the just standard instruments, airspeed indicator, turn and bank indicator, rate of climb or vertical velocity, a couple engine instruments, manifold pressures, and uh, uh, this one here is a, uh, an RPM tachometer for four engines, and this is a uh, radio compass. This is a later model. Now, this looks like a VOR ID 249 indicator. Old radio compass indicator, Pilot directional indicator. Uh, if uh, the autopilot, which is here, that's a control box, if that wasn't working, the uh, aircraft commander had to fly the aircraft manually. Okay. Uh, the bombardier in that uh, station down there, uh, as he was deflecting the aircraft, which was tied into the autopilot to the bomb site, uh, he had you'd see this thing deflect, and a pilot's job was to keep that needle in the center. Now we keep them on course to the target. So that was a pilot directional indicator. Uh, attitude indicator, vertical uh, horizon, whatever you want to call it. Uh, mag compass, you'd set that off, uh, change it from the uh, using the mag compass. And of course over here, uh, altimeter. Okay, that's pretty much standard instruments. And you had uh, a warning uh, lights here, turret warnings main inverter lines, uh, warning lights, and uh, those that come off when you have problems. I would assume these, I haven't seen these for years, this the instrument lights, turn the instrument uh, lights on at night. Wheel, uh, it progressed from a wheel this big down to a little stick like they have in the C-17s. Throttles on this side, locked, and uh, trim wheel, uh, must be a This was the, uh, over here on this side was a control box with the intercom uh, or the radio. You could switch to command, which was the uh, radio that you could talk outside the aircraft with. You could switch to interphone, talk back and forth to the uh, uh, crew member. Okay. Aileron tabs and so forth. The rudder tabs are all over in this area here. So very well set up for the, for the aircraft commander who was on the left seat. Back in the old days, they call those uh, first pilots. Uh, as time went on, they were called to give an aircraft commander designation. Okay. Also throttles, uh, the uh, feathering buttons, various uh, controls here, the navigation lights, outside lights, landing lights. Uh, this question here is uh, wing flap controls, extend and retract. And these are the bomb bay doors, open and close. And of course, the bombardier also could open and close the doors. And this was the autopilot, C1 autopilot. Uh, interestingly, uh, the pilots that I flew with in World War II uh, never got instructions on how to set up the autopilot. The bombardier did because the bombardier used the autopilot considerably when he was making course corrections. The uh, bomb sight head would be tied into the autopilot. Actually, the bombardier <coughs> could uh, take that <laughs> bomb side head and actually steer the airplane with it. So when he put in corrections with his course knobs, uh, he used the autopilot to make uh, make the corrections very, very accurate uh, as far as bombing was concerned. But to set up the autopilot, uh, we were told in bombardier school how to set up the autopilot, so we had to instruct the aircraft commander and, and so forth when we get into a crew on how to set up the autopilot. That's what this thing is here. Just control buttons, and they had sensitivity and all kind of other adjustments and so forth that you made with them. And what else we got here? Let's see. 
heated soup. Interesting. Uh, when the, uh, <coughs> the aircraft first came out, or back in the B-17 days, <coughs> the, uh, you wore uh, regular uh, suits of uh, various kinds of flying suits. Uh, first we had the, uh, the uh, teddy bear suits, which were the sheepskin suits. Uh, they were marginally acceptable. Uh, then eventually they got heated suits, and uh, you plug your heated suit control into this uh, plug here, and you could turn up the rheostat like an electric blanket. It's pretty darn nice. They had electric gloves, they had boots, and so it was very, very comfortable flying. But uh, of course, the B-29 itself uh, was warm. Uh, it uh, was pressurized. You didn't have to wear an oxygen mask in it. And uh, we did in, in combat, of course, in case we lost pressurization. Uh, the, uh, uh, actually, the pressurization was controlled by a little up what is it? Back there, some back a little farther, I guess. They control the pressurization in the aircraft. Uh, the uh, uh, pressurization system, as I mentioned, was controlled from the interior here. Uh, the only problem you might have is explosive decompression. What that meant was that the aircraft was pressurized inside down to about 8 uh, psi or 8,000 feet. And, uh, what would happen if you got a hole in the skin of the aircraft or a window blew out of something, <coughs> you would, you would uh, explosively decompress. In other words, the air inside would rush out of the airplane. <coughs> and uh, you'd immediately go from, say, 8,000 feet up to 25,000. And uh, there was always a little mist that went through. That happened to us just once in combat. When we had the rear pressurized compartment was hit with uh, a 90 millimeter flak shell back there exploded 10 feet above the bomb bay, and uh, we had something like 200 holes in the back end, and we had explosive decompression. And it, a mist filled the whole aircraft, and uh, very weird, and uh, of course we lost pressurization immediately, and our job then was to put oxygen masks on as soon as we could. But our problem back then also in that mission was the fact that our oxygen bottles were shot through too, and we had no oxygen in the back, uh, back of the aircraft. Typical uh, takeoff, I, as I say, I never, uh, I was not a pilot on this aircraft, so a typical takeoff in any aircraft, you had nose wheel steering. Uh, uh, in this case, I don't know how they, they uh, collected it in, but normally you have nose wheel steering or you use brakes to steer, and a B-29, I'm sure, used the brakes, and the nose gear would pivot and so forth, and you'd make your turn. Uh, lining up on the runway, uh, uh, holding your brakes, you'd put in uh, approximately 15 degrees of flaps, which you need on takeoff to give you a ex little extra lift from the wings and, and the throttles forward, and off you'd go. Uh, as far as uh, takeoff was concerned, uh, I'm sure uh, takeoff speed was up around 115, 120, 130 knots, uh, especially if you were heavy. And uh, uh, after takeoff, uh, you call for gear up, flaps up, and in a B-29, neither the aircraft commander or the pilot could see the control surfaces or the gear. They had warning lights, but the scanners, right and left scanners, would call the positions of the gear and the flaps and the, how the engines were looking okay. And a typical comment was from the left scanner is left gear full up, left flap full up, left flaps full up, uh, engines one and two looking okay. And then the right scanner would come in with the same thing. And uh, that's the way they, they uh, knew that the gear and the flaps were up and the engines were operating properly, at least from what they could see back there. Uh, climbing out, uh, like anything else, after you get your, your uh, speed, you start your flaps up and get clean. And uh, uh, up, up a ways, you could turn on the autopilot and let the autopilot fly from there on in. I personally, uh, in a near lower altitude, uh, I always like to fly the aircraft rather than depend on the autopilot to, to do it. The, uh, as far as landing was concerned, it was the same thing. Of course, normal full flap landings, you would uh, uh, turn a, a, use the rectangular pattern in uh, this type of aircraft. And what it is, you'd enter on a, on a 45 degree to a downwind, you'd make your turn to downwind leg. Normally on the downwind leg, you'd put down gear and partial flaps. And as you turn base leg, you start full flaps, and then as you rolled out on the final, you had 
uh, gear down, full slaps, and uh, uh, down the final at a, at a certain airspeed, a vertical velocity reading on your, uh, on your vertical velocity indicator, and uh, above the ground, round out, and uh, you set it on in. And as you round it out, you brought the power back, so it was a coordinated approach and a coordinated use of, of throttles and, uh, and stick or wheel. The bomb site itself, uh, that the Norden bomb site, uh, dependent on a, you had a, an optic, a, a, a telescopic optic that you put your eye on that round black seal there. In fact, there were times when you, you had bomb site eyes because you had a big black ring around your eye from pressing up against the bomb site uh, the, of the optics. Uh, as far as uh, synchronization on a bomb run was concerned, you had two types of knobs, the two silver knobs on the right. You control the direction of the aircraft and, and, and you put in wind drift, took care of wind drift and so forth, so that the target was ta tracking down your fore and aft uh, hair on the, on the bomb site. Uh, on the other right side, a little bit forward, was a rate knobs. And the rate knobs, you control the rate of drive of the optics as they were uh, coming back following the target in. And on that little glass panel that you can see up there, there were two little indices. And uh, what would happen is you had a little trigger. Uh, that was that little thing that had uh, 26 uh, volts on it there, the little trigger. And uh, what you do is put the trigger on, and as those indexes on that glass panel would come together, electrical contact, and drop the bombs automatically. So it, it was a, just an excellent system as long as uh, you knew what you were doing as, as far as the bomb site was concerned. Uh, I mentioned you could have a manual run using the pilot directional indicator, or you could have a coordinated run using the autopilot. Autopilot, of course, was uh, the most accurate. And I mentioned you could clutch that bomb site head into the uh, vertical gyro that was in that big black box down below, and you could use your uh, uh, bomb site head to steer the aircraft. In fact, in bombardier school, there were a couple of times where the uh, after we finished bombing on the bombing ranges, the uh, pilot uh, would uh, ask the bombardier who was sitting in a seat there to bring the aircraft back to the base, so you better know where you were because you steered the aircraft back to the base using the bomb site head. So, very embarrassing if you didn't know where the base was. As I mentioned, I never flew as a flight engineer. I had complete respect for the one that uh, the flight engineers that I flew with. Usually uh, tech sergeants and master sergeants are very familiar with the aircraft. And not only the crew chief, but they were the flight engineer itself. They knew the aircraft uh, front to rear. Uh, just excellent people. Uh, they had complete duplicate controls here. They had uh, control of the fuel. They had control of the throttles. Uh, all kind of things, vacuum pumps, electric valve. They say, this would drive you crazy. Regular amount of, of instruments here, flight instruments. They'd have uh, also uh, engine instruments that they would monitor. Uh, actually, they had uh, uh, the uh, engine controls to start the engines back here. And uh, fire detectors, uh, fire bottles, they had just about everything you needed. Uh, the flight engineer and the uh, aircraft commander uh, were, were usually very close. Uh, they, uh, one complemented the other both ways. And uh, they worked very closely together to keep the aircraft uh, in flight, flying, takeoff, landings, uh, any emergencies in flight, and any changes in power in flight, they would be coordinated between the flight engineer and the aircraft commander. Uh, just a, uh, as I say, we did most utmost respect for the people that flew in the in the flight engineer's uh, seat and panel here. Let's take a look at this. This was the uh, uh, navigator was over here. This was the radio operator. Uh, okay, this is the radio operator's position. Uh, he uh, had his uh, uh, VHF, UHF radios, HF radios, any, any kind of radio that you needed in the aircraft with the control boxes and, and so forth. He sat here, navigator on the left side. He had some flight instruments here, radio instruments and so forth that uh, help in his, his uh, navigation uh, of the aircraft. 
Uh, you will also notice that this is a pressurized compartment with a pressurized door here. This was closed in flight. Flint area was pressurized. The tunnel was pressurized. And that went to the back area back there where the scanners and the radar observer uh, were. And uh, this tunnel is supposedly uh, 32 inches in diameter. And uh, it's uh, very interesting to crawl through. Uh, it had a little bit of, of a give here. And uh, I was watching a documentary the other day where it said that, uh, that uh, you couldn't crawl through the uh, tunnel with a, a parachute on. Well, I beg to differ because one night in, uh, in Korea, we had uh, uh, two very critically wounded in the back, and we ran out of uh, <coughs> plasma and uh, uh, bandages. And uh, so I volunteered to come up through the tunnel. Uh, and I didn't want to leave my parachute because we didn't know if the airplane was going to keep on flying. So I came through with a parachute on, and you can do it. And I'm no little guy myself, so I got through it. But anyway, I picked up the plasma and the first aid stuff and carried it back through the tunnel to the back. Uh, rear compartment, uh, what can you say? Had, had the, the sighting stations back there for the gunners, and then they were own pressurized compartment, and then there was a pressure door like this, and this edge here going into the bomb bay, and, uh, and then there was another pressure door going to the rear. It closed off the tail gunner's pressurized compartment, so we had three pressurized compartments. Uh, one thing that happened in, uh, uh, in during the combat missions, you uh, uh, the bombs were loaded, of course, and you had to uh, go out into the bomb bays and pull the uh, little cotta keys that were stuck into the fuses to allow the fuses, little propellers to spin and arm the bombs. Well, after takeoff, everything settled down and you're flying on the way back up and, and uh, you, the bombardier would go out and he could get into the forward bomb bay and he would pull the pins in the bomb bay. The central fire control gunner would pull the pins in the rear bomb bay on the bomb so that the, when the bombs would drop, they're armed and explode when they hit. This is our uh, B-29-1790 where we uh, were hit real uh, severely as we were bombing a power plant on the Yalu River at the Suiho Dam. We had over 200 holes in the aircraft. We uh, were able to get it back to an air base uh, K-13 at Suwon just south of Seoul uh, where we landed and, uh, and we got the wounded out and so forth. But that's 1790. It was so accurate they hit our number three prop at 24,500 feet. And this is our, uh, our crew that uh, went to uh, Korea with. Uh, on the left here, and two pilots. The aircraft commander is in the center, Ralph Walt. Navigator, bombardier. Central fire control gunner, radio operator. Right scanner, left scanner, flight engineer, and tail gunner. Great guys, loved all of them, and uh, we've lost several of them that uh, have passed away uh, since uh, we got back. And uh, the night of uh, September 12th, I was telling you about where we got hit so badly, this just shows part of the damage. The uh, bomb uh, exploded, uh, they figured, 20 feet above the bomb bay in the uh, part of the aircraft. And this is, shows a par partial number of holes going through the aircraft. It hit the left scan, the right scan here very badly. He uh, was, had a terrible head wound and the uh, spare radar operator who was clearing the bomb bays after the bombs dropped hit him. He was hit in the stomach and in the leg and uh, a couple of others got superficial wounds that uh, didn't require any, uh, any, any uh, repair and so forth. But anyways, that's one picture of the aircraft. That went. We had a successful bomb drop, and uh, this picture here shows the Yalu River coming down, the park, uh, the, the dam itself, and this area here is where the power plant was that we were hitting that night. And that's it. <laughs> that uh, pretty much uh, concludes our tour of the B-29A uh, Super Fortress, uh, one of the greatest aircraft in the world. The last one was retired in 1960. 
uh, tears in our eyes as we watched it go, but uh, that happens to all the aircraft eventually. But I hope you enjoyed uh, the tour, and uh, uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you on further tours. So thank you very much.